We shouldn't be banning guns for law-abiding citizens. We should be focusing on making sure that citizens who should not get guns in the first place don't get those guns. And that is why we see a big breakdown in the system here. It's been two weeks since 17 people were killed in a mass shooting at a school in Parkland, Florida. Now students and teachers are going back to class, but are they any safer? The attack has galvanized the campaign for gun reform in the United States, but President Donald Trump has refused to confront the country's gun lobby. Congress won't issue any bans on the weapons and said it won't take up Trump's proposal to arm teachers. So what's stopping another mass shooting from happening again? Well, to discuss that, I'm joined from New York by Paul Michael Violas, a terrorism analyst who worked as a security specialist in the New York District Attorney's Office, and in Washington by Michael Beer. He's the executive director of Nonviolence International. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, Paul Violas, let me begin with you. Two weeks on, let's kind of look at the big picture now with regards Parkland. Was it a misapplication of the current gun laws and just human error, whether it's by local police, the FBI, and so, so forth? Or is it becoming clearer and clearer that something fundamentally needs to change in terms of gun control? I think all of the above. I mean, that's how I would describe that. But I'll break that down as follows. What we saw was a, a perfect storm with respect to um, law enforcement, the warning signs that were given off, the amount of time that the shooter spent for, for over a year saying what he was going to do, a breakdown in school security, and gun laws that completely have gone away. Okay, so perfect storm of all of the above. Michael Beer, so I know you're, you're all for nonviolence, and I'm assuming you're, you're not a fan of guns, but would you agree that had authorities done their job properly, those kids would not have been butchered, no matter what the laws are? I'm sure the authorities um, can always improve and do better, but frankly, the authorities have their hands tied here currently in the United States because we're awash in guns with 300 million guns and millions of semi-automatic uh, weapons. And so there's very little the authorities can do because there's massacres that are going on almost every day in this country. Paul Violas, is that fair? Yeah, it's, it's, it's more than fair, but, but we still have to remember this, and this is the bottom line when it comes to incidences like this, and I agree, but the totality of this incident here was entirely avoidable. We cannot escape that fact. We cannot divert this to a gun issue or any other issue. This kid said what he was gonna do. He said it multiple times, and unfortunately, after 38 years in law enforcement, I'm gonna say law enforcement failed here. They were told what was gonna happen. They didn't do what they needed to do to prevent this. That is the ultimate reason for what happened here. Clearly, we have a gun issue in the United States. There are far too many people that have guns in the United States that should not. And in this case, clearly, that was one of them. But that was not the impetus behind what we saw in Parkland. And Paul, for those who are focusing on the NRA now and directing their anger towards them, is that the right thing to do, or are they going down the wrong path? It's, a, it's the wrong path, but I'll tell you, I am not an NRA member. So this is not wave the flag for the NRA. I am not an NRA member. But it's not an NRA issue at this point. Empirical data is empirical data. Shooters, active shooters, school violence shooters, workplace violence shooters are not NRA members. And that's a fact. We know that to be true. So yes, do you want to focus on NRA because the NRA is such a powerful lobby, because they control so much influence in various state legislatures as well as the federal government? Yes, I get that point. But going down the road to pound the hammer on, on the NRA is not going to solve this particular problem. Right, Paul, but following the logic, right, if the NRA is that powerful and they're pumping tens of millions of dollars into the pockets of politicians who are supporting legislation or quashing legislation that doesn't address gun control, that, that you say needs to be addressed, Surely they're a prime target here. They're the ones you want to go after because they're skewing the political narrative and, I guess, paralyzing the system, right? They, they are paralyzing the system, and that's the best word to actually use at this point. But we're still looking at a problem that's generated by the legislators. Legislators are taking funds during the campaign from the NRA. We know this to be true. It's public information. 
That buys influence. We know that to be true. We've known this in the United States for a long time. What we're seeing now is this really coming to life before the general public's eyes as to how difficult it's going to be to effect positive change with respect to gun control and evaluating people with mental health issues before they're allowed to carry a gun, constitutional right issues, and the ultimate decision, how much are we in the United States willing to invest in the safety of our children and protecting schools realistically? How much are we willing to embrace our need and responsibility for the reality of security, not the illusion of security? Okay, and does that mean arming teachers? No. Absolutely okay. no. Okay. No, absolutely not. Absolutely okay. not. Michael Beer, let's talk about the NRA for a moment because what Paul's saying is okay, it's all well and good that Delta and United cut ties with the NRA and Dick Sporting Goods. And I guess what he's saying is it's a bit of virtue signaling. We're seeing a lot of passion, a lot of people going out and being outspoken with regards to the NRA, but it's not going to make a difference because empirically they're not at the root of the problem. Michael, address that. Um, I agree with uh, my colleague here um, that the NRA is uh, part of the problem, but is definitely not the totality of the problem. Uh, obviously, the gun industry loves massacres because it makes the society more afraid, so they'll buy more guns. So, in fact, the gun industry loves this kind of thing, and the NRA can't be is sometimes a shill for the gun industry. But as he indicated, uh, many of these killers are not members of the NRA. Um, I think our colleague also makes other great points in the fact that we have um, many guns in the hands of people who are domestic abusers and who send many signals uh, that they are and have a history of being violent. And we have virtually no way of getting guns out of these folks' hands. So we have a problem that really uh, cuts across many, yeah. many areas. But I want to specifically say we should not be scapegoating the mentally ill. Um, we know that scapegoating the mentally ill or a minority group for a society's problem is something that's done a lot in many countries. And... The mentally ill are more often the victim of gun violence than they are perpetrators, and they're a minority of the people carrying out massacres. Okay, good point. Paul, let me ask you about the kids, tremendously articulate and passionate kids, David Hogg, Emma Gonzalez, and so forth, these kids who saw their friends massacred in front of them, not on a battlefield, but when they were at school. They've come out, they've been vocal. A lot of them have been punching up in the biggest way possible against the president, against their politicians, and so forth. People seem to believe that these young people have turned the dial a little bit, and they've opened up the conversation a bit, and they're making real impact. Would you agree with that? I would, and quite frankly, it's evidenced by the mere fact that globally respected television programs such as the one we are on right now with you have recognized that this is an issue that needs to be spoken about at greater length. We know, being in the media, that incidences like this in the United States oftentimes fall by the wayside after two or three days after the incident. But it's not now. And I credit these young adults for using their constitutional right in a productive way. In a productive way. They're not burning cars and, and creating havoc. They're using their constitutional rights, and they're speaking up, and they're projecting what change needs to be implemented in the United States. And I applaud them for that. I, and I, I believe we should all applaud them for that. Michael Beer, when they say, we are going to be the last school shooting, is that a slogan or is it possible? Uh, it's a slogan, but there's no doubt that the young people can make a difference here. This is going to make, take uh, generations to get uh, control of 300 million guns. Uh, and to uh, make better uh, regulations so that uh, people who shouldn't have guns um, can't get them. So uh, there are 50 states in the United States, each one's with different gun laws, and it's going to take uh, a long, long road uh, 
uh, in order to uh, get to where we want to go. We have massacres uh, almost every day in this country, and we have school shootings uh, a few every week in this country. Paul Violas, looking at what some of the politicians have been doing, especially, I mean, predominantly on the Republican side, uh, Governor Rick Scott, uh, we look at Senator Marco Rubio from Florida, Brian Mast, and so forth, seeming to want to listen, whether it's with regards universal background checks and so forth. They're seemingly bending more than they used to in the past. Does that encourage you? No, no, it really doesn't, but I'll tell you why it doesn't encourage me. Because what I'm seeing right now is grandstanding. I'm not hmm. seeing anybody that's really willing to sit down, roll their sleeves up, and get the job done, and to address the difficult issues. And, and what I mean by that is to address issues such as gun control that we've talked about, but we, we, you know, it's one of these cycling, revolving door issues that we really never address. What I hear right now that's not encouraging are people that are taking advantage of a horrible situation to put out situations and to project solutions that they know are clearly not feasible in the short term. They know that, but they're going to say that anyway. And they can always come back later on and then say, well, you know what? I said it. I stood for it. It can throw my hands up in defeat to saying it's not my fault. It didn't happen. So I don't see that. Well, the only thing that's going to really encourage me is when I see legitimate efforts from politicians that are more concerned with doing their job than keeping their job and making the tough decisions, not concerned with who, what side of the aisle they're on, but making sure we're not stuffing more body bags at schools every other week. Okay, I'll let that be the final word. Passionately put, Paul Michael Violas and Michael Beer. I thank you both for joining us here on The Newsmakers. It was a pleasure.